um, the controller itself actually has a mathematical estimation of the actual process. In other words, the PIND algorithms, no problem, the PR, uh, PIND algorithms are a mathematical estimation of the actual process. Yes, and it is valid within certain parameters, but we know how the thing works. And the, and the model works on a reactive basis. In other words, it reacts to a error. Okay? And we know how that error is actually controlled. So when we now look at the limitations to that type of controller, three big ones come into um, uh, three main um, uh, issues come into where PI and D feedback, PI and D feedback loops aren't exactly the best way. So the biggest one is where the the gain isn't linear. So for instance, um, if we have a reaction and the the actual point is fairly linear between the process variable and the manipulated variable. So that's what we, we, we have. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a good interrelationship, a fairly linear and constant all the way through. So we have we know that the um, for a certain input you expect to get a certain output. Plus the other part is one that it has no time delay. In other words, there isn't a delay from the time that you um, create a actuated change to the time that you actually get a um, a actual um, uh, output change. Okay, so that's that's one of the things. Plus, also, so that's that, those two things. Firstly, the linear relationship of the output to the input and also the time delay between the output and input creates problems for the algorithm that we've already discussed. Plus, if we throw in one of the common uh, points of, sorry, I'm just drawing this very badly, but I hopefully you'll be understanding. Um, if you put in a high frequency noise component into it, it also becomes a, um, a uh, a issue as well. So those three things alone um, urge controllers or the people who develop controllers to think of different ways of um, trying to control the process. Plus there is a added um, complexity where you wish to take a more holistic view of the whole process. In other words, not just of a single loop but of the interrelationship between all the different um, parameters, all the different points from the whole plant or a, a wider selection of them. Okay? In other words, multiple inputs and outputs. So to do that, they've come up or there is a characteristic of um, various points and they are basically split into two or a combination of two and that is feedback and feed forward control. So feedback control including adaptive control and optimal control gives the, um, still works on the feedback principle but allows a better optimization routine to occur. In other words, it, it tunes the parameter in a, um, in a predict, uh, sorry, in a more uh, model effective point. So adaptive control generally changes the the type of relationship, whereas optimal control tends to tune the relationship. But when we take it to a next step and say we wish to introduce more variables, we will go to something like a predictive model. Now the predictive model, it's just as we looked at before, um, looks at feed forward mechanisms and the feed forward mechanisms also um, give you the ability to overcome dead time, look at the, um, the various 
relationships and then split those into two groups of controllers, what is referred to as a linear um, mod, uh, predictive model or a non-linear predictive model. Now, the linear predictive model um, is a good way to overcome dead time, but also to be able to change the process based upon a linear relationship. And where it gets a little bit more complicated is when you don't have a linear relationship, you may have an inverse squared, you may have a sinus sort of relationship, whatever the mathematical equation is, you start to do a few more intricate calculations based upon the reaction. Okay, And that includes um, artificial neural networks, uh, linear weighted uh, models, and fuzzy logic, which takes in not fuzzy logic, but the nonlinear takes in multiple inputs, works out the relationship, both in terms of steady state and dynamic, and also a few other things, but you find the interrelationship. So that there is a deal of um, process optimization based upon um, another more complex model of the process. Okay, so why worry about other things other than the actual loop because you will, for instance, have different parts of the process interfering with the your actual point. In, the, in other words, you have multiple interactions and they could very easily disturb the direction, the direct relationship from where you want to be compared to its action. So let me let me try and um, give you a, a simple example. We have a, a which um, I've introduced it before. We have a level tank and we have the water going into the level tank. Okay. So if we know based upon a, re a mathematical relationship, the amount of flow that goes into the tank is directly proportional to the level that in the tank. We know that and that's because we have a good mathematical relationship and we can predict that. We have constant volume, the density is the same, so anything that goes in, the level must go up. So that's the direct relationship for the level, the amount of flow over a certain period of time in there. Now, what happens if we now introduce another influence, in other words, the drain? The drain then becomes a disturbance which reflects the relationship between the, uh, the flow going in, the level, in a, um, in a counteractive way. In other words, you have to increase the amount of fluid going in to compensate for the amount of fluid going out. Okay. So immediately that becomes two variables you have to then contend with to get the final outcome. Now what happens if we um, get a non-linear tank? In other words, we fill it, oh sorry, it has um, a conical type of tank. Then the relationship no longer is um, uh, a linear relationship in the volume, you have to count and uh, counteract for that as well. And also, for instance, if we have a high volatile um, um, liquid, such as um, uh, or anyway, something that can evaporate very easily, then the uh, the amount of level also has to take into account that evaporation rate. So suddenly from a simple one in, one out, you suddenly have one, two, three, four variables, all of which will influence the level. So hence, by understanding the process more, understanding the interrelationships more, you get a far better model of the uh, relationship, of the um, the point to give you a better um, predictive model. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right.
Thanks. So, because we will use it again, I just I just find it very um, useful to um, um, to have something. Yeah, yeah. The simple, simple. I think simple example is a good. So, and then we let's yeah, let's take the example a little bit further, <laughs> where we have um, a um, a kiln, and now a kiln, a lime kiln, is used in um, as the end product of this particular step into paper manufacture. So you use it to as an additive into paper. Uh, that's what the lime um, does. And it also can be used into things like um, uh, concrete or cement. But that's that's anyway, it's it's part it's just one part of a process. Um, sorry, someone's trying to get my attention. No. Okay. All right. um, so it's just one part of a process. So but itself is also a relatively finicky. What? Sorry, that's a bad word. A relatively sensitive to disturbance type of material. So, um, so the actual process is what is described here in terms of the relationship between the inputs and outputs. So, what are the inputs? Are basically the raw material, what is referred to as the mud, and it's a slurry of. Uh, lime and other type of um, other type of material, um, and it needs to get dried out. So it gets dried out um, by having gas and air pumped through it. So we know that if we put in a certain amount of gas, a certain amount of air, for a certain amount of um, mud or what is um, okay, no problem. Um, we will get a combination of the type of um, output coming out of it. Now, it just so happens that the important aspect to that particular um, kiln or the particular process, um, oh, your computer blew up. So hopefully you're, you, we have recovered. Looks like you have. Um, so the, um, thank you for that. So we wish to measure the temperature of the output. We need we need to control the temperature of the actual raw product because it will tell us what is the humidity level and therefore what can actually go into the next product. However, inside that particular equation or that effect, we note that if we have um, a couple of other physical constraints, in other words, the amount of oxygen that we have to burn the particular point, the, the, the gas, and also the um, amount of uh, energy within the hood, or in other words, how much actually is there, that also affects the consistency. Okay, so you have now a relatively um, um, complex interrelationship, but the important aspects is that the outputs can also affect the inputs, and the inputs can also be constrained to affect the outputs. So the idea is that we then are able to get a interrelationship based upon our knowledge of the process more and more often, um, and that's in the um, the ability to have a high level complexity. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the intermediary steps towards that complexity is to have um, higher level um, adaptions of the uh, adaptations I should say of the uh, PIMD and for instance bringing in um, as we mentioned earlier the um, feed forward model of time delay into something like a Smith predictor and a couple of other types of uh, things where you are able to tune the process but Again, single input, single output. 